Ladies and gentlemen, stop what you are doing. Click the subscribe button. Click the bell. Make sure you don't miss a show because today it's my guy time. See who we're planting the flag on. See who we're not leaving drafts without. Don't miss a moment. Hey, this is Austin Eckler, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. It's my guy time. Hey! Yeah! Hey! Hey! You just you just got me jacked up. <laughs> yes! Yes, I was yesterday I was excited for today. I was not excited today. Also, welcome wait, to the fantasy footballers. Wait, you were excited yesterday, but you weren't excited today? No, you, I was you all, burned out? I was tilty. I tried mm. all night long. All night. To trade for two of my my guys that are on the same team. And it seemed like it was so close. Kept getting strung along. Okay, I think I like it. I need more time. I need more time. And then eventually it came to the morning. I, I got to tell you in the morning. I don't know. And then I wake oh, up. That's... I'm ready to record my my guys episode. Come in. Talk about how I traded for my guys. It's like, nah. My gut says no. When your trade partner says, I'm going to sleep on it, <sighs> you should just go find another trade partner. I'm sorry they didn't work out. I tried to do the same thing this week with my my guys, but certain people just uh, they were not budging. It, it's a bit of a catch twenty two because they kind of they kind of pick up on the fact that they're your guys, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and then the price just keeps going up. Now, Mike, I kept my welcome in short because I thought something might be coming there. Mm-hmm. I thought you might be jumping in. Now, everybody, man of the people, now Gotta that give you've the people all what they want. Now that you've all turned your radios down after that introduction, your radios, yeah. <laughs> The transistor is a little loud. Don't today. you still call it a radio in your car? I mean, I guess it's just. What a, do you call it? It's a you, funny word. If you play your podcast, what do you play it on? Uh, your phone. Okay, but I play through, it in my through, car. Through what? My car. Your stereo. Okay, so you say stereo. Yeah, that still sounds old, Mike. <laughs> not, not as old as old time radio. I did not say old time. <laughs> you said radio. That is old time. <laughs> it's. It, we're on Sirius XM radio this afternoon. We're on satellite. Yeah, okay. satellite. This is the future. We're not. Ladies and gentlemen, today's news on the AM radio. Brought to you by Bane. <laughs> no, I like that impression. Uh, moving on, the Ultimate Draft Kit is available at ultimatedraftkit.com. If you get it before our Friday live stream, mm-hmm. we are going to be giving away an Ultimate Draft Kit for life. Live on that event, uh, that is 6 p.m. Eastern. We'll be on YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Facebook. Make sure you follow us. Um, there'll be a countdown on the live stream. We'll be answering fantasy football questions throughout, and then we're going to give away that UDK for life. To be eligible, you need to have purchased the 2020 UDK prior to that moment in time. So if you've already got it, you're entered. If you haven't got it yet, ultimatedraftkit.com. It is the My Guys episode. Hoo-ha! Very excited. YouTube.com slash the fantasy footballers, by the way, if you want to watch the My Guys episode and see Jason slowly gaining energy over the course of the morning. And let me just I say this quickly there gaining are, energy. Yes, thank you, Mike. You have you have filled my soul. Uh it was depleted. The the let me just say this to all the folk land out there. You know, I would say the majority are podcast listeners. Um Maybe you have never even looked at the YouTube. Maybe you've gone when we've had a funny show moment. But maybe you haven't subscribed. Right. Just go over there and give us that subscribe. So 195. Exactly. It's, it's getting close. You guys want to talk some news? Yep. News and notes from around the league. NFL Network reporting that Dalvin Cook and the Vikings have broken off contract talks with the, you know, Hopes they had hopes of an extension. It's not going to happen. He's focused on week one. Do you care for fantasy purposes? Nope. Yeah, I mean, uh, if anything, this now means it's an official contract year where we know he's not holding out and we know he wants to get paid more. So what do you have to do if you want to make that money? Have a, I mean, he's not going to get paid the same if he gets injured this year. So all the incentive to play well, play hard, play through injury, 
but I agree with Mike. I was already drafting him like that. You could have a situation where the salary cap comes down next year. Teams are not as aggressive and a bunch of agents are in trouble because they didn't get things mm. done in time before this happened. Well, and you also have the franchise tag is available for Dalvin. DeAndre Hopkins returned to practice on Wednesday. He had a hamstring tweak, but he's back. That's good news. That That's great. is good news. Did A.J. Green get back? Not yet. Okay, he's on. He's almost back. He's coming any day now. ESPN reporting Miles Sanders will be ready to play week one. There was the week-to-week -week injury. We just have a quote from an unnamed source saying he'll be ready to play week one. Those are upsetting to me. I don't the see that source? as – No, not the unnamed source. The He should be ready to go week one is not good news to me. Like the, that, that implies that there's – that the, the concern – is that he might not. Well, here's the thing that, that I'm going – my confidence is in uh, Coach Peterson was, I mean, at least verbally giving the old the, – the pat on the back to the running back room saying even with a couple guys banged up, they're still secure in the running back room. They're not looking to add anybody. Now, could they still add somebody and blow that statement up? Absolutely. But at least what we have to go on is they're, they're still confident that Sanders is good to go. We'll see, though. Is it good to go for a big workload in week one? That is the, the bigger question. If you're making a decision in your draft with any sort of you know, difference maker in the equation, Miles Sanders or maybe some of the players we talk about today, mm -hmm. this could be the difference. I, I did tweak my uh, risk rating. and it, as, as far as looking at where I would draft Miles Sanders, there are two players today we're talking about that are now in front of him mm. because they're all great. Why take the one with current risk of, of possibly missing week one. Devontae Adams. What's the latest on the injury for Devontae Adams? So if you didn't follow along, what this is, I mean, this is a hot tip. You got to get on Twitter. Number one, you can follow the show at the FF Ballers. But follow Beat Reporters. This is what we have to go off of right now. I mean, Roto World is a, is a tremendous news source, but go right to the source. Get those Beat Reporters. Follow lists of uh, well, my, my source is a man who follows the source. Yes. <laughs> and I don't want to use like a, like you're a druggie kind of comparison, but like you're oh, super I've, a druggie for I these am, news bits, man. I am mainlining all you are training like, camp news directly into my body. And like Andy knows it is like, Hey Mike, is there news? That's, that's Andy's news source. I love it. Well, I know when there's not news, yes. you know, after about 45 minutes, you Starts shaking, and I know there has not been any breaking <laughs> news. On, baby. We got to oh, get man. Mike some beat reporters fluff piece at the least, right? But so yesterday, Devonte Adams he he got shook on a at a reception, or I can't remember if he caught the ball. Anyways, but he went down, uh, left the field. He did come back uh, to participate in the final walkthrough, but he is now not participating in today's practice. It I'm not reading too far into it, but it's. These are always just, you know, put a little check mark down. I got to uh, I got to take a peek ski in on Devontae Adams. What it did bring to mind was like there are two situations in the NFL where if a guy goes down, I have no idea what happens to that part of the offense. Mm -hmm. Devontae Adams, if he goes down, what on earth is the passing offense in Green Bay? Yeah, you lost Funches. You don't have other weapons. I mean, Lazard is not going to be your one. He would be the de facto. I mean, he would be. That's the problem. Which is insane. Yeah, it, it would take Aaron Rodgers, who is – I mean, look, this is the latest you've ever been able to draft Aaron Rodgers. I I think he still has something left, but, I mean, it, we're, we can't be certain, which is why he's being drafted at the end of, you know, at the end of fantasy drafts. But if Devontae Adams misses time, you're not playing Aaron Rodgers. No, and, and so Adams – and, and – for what it's worth, he hasn't played a full season in four years. So he, pro you know, he's missed a game or two each of the past three years. Goes down, makes you think about it a little bit. The other situation is Derrick Henry, the running back in you know in Tennessee. If he went down and the whole offense is built around him, uh, Darrington Evans, anyone? Yeah, doesn't yeah. doesn't the Devontae Adams situation just highlight how head scratching that draft was for yes. the Packers, where it was like there yes. were so many great <laughs> wide receivers to just. I mean, when they were on the board, and then they took AJ Dillon, who hey, he looks he looks great in those tiny shorts, big thighs, but 
you've got a good running back core. Now, if Devontae Adams goes down, that GM. Yeah, but just wait. In, when, in three or four years, when Jordan Love gets a chance to start, we won't be talking about them not drafting a wide receiver, will we? Yeah, I don't know how this team ends up repeating anything close to last year if they lose Devontae Adams with their – they had won so many one-score games. I mean, <laughs> we're talking about a long time. Look, I, I don't think Devontae Adams is really hurt long-term. We're just prognosticating here what would happen. What's the news on Rob Gronkowski, former superstar tight end? Sure. So shout out to our friends at Roster Watch. They have some boots on the ground at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers training camp. And all morning, it has simply just been a reminder, don't draft Rob Gronkowski. The, the name is, is gigantic. He is a Hall of Fame tight end. But O.J. Howard is still the number one guy there. He, and they're saying, it, look, they're comparing Rob Gronkowski's usage, at least in these practices, to that of of late career Antonio Gates. Yeah, Antonio Gates, he, he came through in the red zone. He was a specialist there. He's catching touchdowns. But Rob Gronkowski, if you're drafting him, don't don't think you are getting Rob Gronkowski from three years ago if you are drafting him. I think you just have to – I mean, and O.J. Howard, I mean, terribly disappointing season last year. Destroyed fantasy Yeah, owners. do we get a post-hype bounce back for Howard? See, I, I was going the other direction. I, I'd steer clear of all – Bruce Arians and his, his history with tight ends combined with a depth chart that has three different guys that are going to be out there and a ton of actual, you know – Scotty Miller is back. You have Watson. You have Godwin. You have Evans. Uh, I don't know if you're going to have any consistent production from any specific tight end in Tampa. That's fair. All right. We are going to jump right in to my guys. But first, I want to remind everybody, go sign up for Underdog Fantasy today. You can enter their best ball mania. It's a chance at $1 million in prizes which they just launched, you can go to underdogfantasy.com. You can also search for Underdog Fantasy in the App Store. Underdog is where you want to play best ball. This is a question we get all off season long, and there's been some desperate people out there saying, "Where? what happened to Draft? I mean, Draft used to be our studio sponsor and you know, such a great product, but then you know, Draft was sold, and w what do I replace it with? Underdog Fantasy is what you want to play on. The feedback that we've gotten, extremely positive. Um, and you can get in on the best ball mania, a chance at 1 million in prizes. Best ball's a blast. It lets you put into effect a lot of these stra strategic type of things we've talked about, about, you know, redraft leagues right away into best ball. And we've been giving tips each and every week as well, which you can go back and listen to. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. If, if you're good at fantasy football, which you're listening, you're, you're probably good at fantasy football. You, you're, you've got an edge in these leagues. And if you want to get better at fantasy football, then these are real leagues to, to so try them out. Yeah, yeah, to check them out. And, and Folkland, do not forget about the Ultimate Draft Kit. I know we've got the big UDK for Life giveaway going on right now. If you buy the UDK, you're automatically entered. But we just want to make sure everyone knows. Like every, every fantasy player in the world will go into their draft with some sort of rankings. That we Even if, even if it's just the, the average draft position on the platform, not everybody's rankings are the same. Our rankings, we don't want to toot, toot our horn too much. But you but always they have do. Been, <laughs> look, they've been top 10 three years in a row. They're very accurate, and they are tier-based with blurbs that break down the differences between players in the same area. Everybody who gets it usually gets it again the next year. They love it. They succeed. You're building a foundation for your year, and you could do that at ultimatedraftkit.com. Now let's get in to some my guys. Nothing you can say mm -hmm. can tear me away. That's it's time. That's right. These are our confidence picks for 2020. These are our plant the flag players. These are sign your name next to their name players for 2020. It's always an adventure getting to this point. Last year, we had the My Guys show early. Very early. A little too <laughs> early, <laughs> which... Uh, was tough, but we had the the tour, and we wanted to do the My Guys event on the tour. Well, that that was the the infamous Dante Pettis turn. Pivot, yes, yes. Which look from my guy to anti guy. I mean that that was right on the money. Yeah, I'm really Whew, that was a close one. <laughs> quite 
quite pleased with that decision, to be honest. Uh, but we're going to jump right in. Each of us has uh, three My Guys that we're going to bring to you. It, did you want to add anything to that in- introduction? I mean, how do you look at these sure, players? So, so, like, so for me here, uh, and you know what, I'll, I will kick off the show here. I will give my first My Guy. It's a wide receiver going in the fifth round. My planting the flag saying, this is my guy. Am I saying that DJ Chark is going to be the number one wide receiver? No, but that's, I'm saying. That's what I heard. <laughs> I heard it. Cut that up. Cut that up. Ship it. Fine. <laughs> DJ Chark, number one wide receiver <laughs> overall. Look, I, the draft value is absolutely incredible. I believe he will return ADP at the bare minimum. I love his upside. So here's what, what I want to talk about with DJ Chark. First, 6'4", 200 pounds, top 4% speed score, was drafted in the second round, was absolutely left for dead. Guilty. I left DJ Chark for dead. I wanted nothing to do with him in the rookie drafts. Uh, he went to the Jaguars. The you know the, the, the fantasy stench of the Jaguars is a real thing, and it happened throughout the entire season. But DJ Chark still finished as the wide receiver 16 in 15 games, and honestly, before his week 14 ankle injury, he was the wide receiver eight, went over a thousand yards, had eight touchdowns, and what I really like moving forward about DJ Chark, aside from his ADP being in the fifth round, uh, he's being drafted behind where he finished last year. Gardner Minshew is now the full time starting quarterback. Gardner Minshew had the best passer rating on deep passes last year. He's actually a very competent quarterback last year. DJ Chark, 13 catchable deep targets. How many to come down with? All 13. He was tied for six with deep receptions with Tyler Lockett. Like, he's an incredible deep threat. And Minshew was talking about his relationship with DJ Chark, and he said, I mean, this is a quote, I mean, last time, this time last year, we didn't get to work together very much at all. We had a few reps in the preseason, and then we were kind of thrown in there in the regular season. That was the production that we got from Gardner Minshew. Just They weren't planning on Minshew being the starter. They gave Nick Foles a huge contract. They draft Minshew in, I believe, the sixth, sixth round. Yeah. I mean, he's a complete afterthought. He's not getting reps with DJ Chark or the receiving crew, and yet he came through. And DJ Chark, like I said, the wide receiver eight before going down with his ankle injury in week 14. Now you get an improved offense. You get uh, Jay Gruden is now the offensive coordinator. Jay Gruden offenses have finished top 15 in passing touchdowns in six of the nine years that he's either been an OC or a head coach. And you know who's got experience coaching a later round QB? Jay Gruden. People don't really remember this. Kirk Cousins was a fourth round draft pick. He was not drafted to be the guy, but they found the talent. I believe that Jacksonville has found their talent in Gardner Minshew. It's all systems go. They're giving him the chance to be the guy. And I think that the connection with DJ Chark, it was just natural. Now let's spend an entire offseason beefing that up. On top of that, I mean, DJ Chark, he, DJ Chark is a solid route runner. I'm not going to crown him as an elite Keenan Allen type of a route runner yet, but he is very solid. He scores very well in reception perception, and he's the number one target. He is the unquestioned number one target for this team that – yeah, they, last- they might be trailing a lot, by, but when I say might, I mean they will be trailing <laughs> a lot, and they're going to have to go to DJ Chark. Yeah, last year there was question marks as to who is the number one guy, yeah. and this year it, it, it is clear. So is this what I heard is that Gardner Minshew is like a my guy light. You're just like you're Look, in I'm on. Fine with, I'm fine with late round Gardner. He's actually his guy's own my guy. Like DJ Chark's my yes. guy is Gardner. That makes you know sense. What I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, you see him shotgunning those energy drinks? Two, two questions Gardner for you, Minch. though. Because uh, you've talked about Chark a lot this offseason. I'm not surprised he's a my guy. It One thing, just to point out, the end of season for DJ Chark, fantasy owners need to remember this. It just ends up being reflected in the ADP sometimes. It was a sour end of the season just due to injury, and all of a sudden, he's a fifth-round pick. Yep. The other question is, he's being drafted as the wide receiver 20. He's your my guy. I think, not that you're calling for him to end up there, but what is the actual ceiling in your mind? When you say he's going to be a value at that position, does that mean you believe he's a top 10 wide receiver? The ceiling is absolutely a, a top 10 wide receiver to me. I'm 
top five is, is that's probably a little bit too far out of the realistic projections. But like I said, he was a, he was a top ten wide receiver before he went down with the ankle injury. He missed a game and then he tried to play through it, and the production just it simply wasn't there. So it, it's not that he hasn't done it. He just a couple games kept him out of the official top ten. So to finish as a wide receiver sixteen, I don't think it's a stretch to say. Yeah, that guy could probably move up into the top 10. I, I love the pick. I, I'm going to go next because one of the kind of points of reasoning that you have for DJ Chark is one of the same for my guy here, which is you have the evidence last season in a stretch. Now, it wasn't 16 games, but you have the evidence in a stretch that he could be a top 10 guy. My guy that I have the most confidence in of any player, maybe in the last three or four years, is Josh Jacobs. Josh Jacobs is my guy for 2020. I think he is a guarantee. I think he is 100% guaranteed to take the next step in fantasy. I don't know if I've been as sure of a player as I am in Josh Jacobs. Um, you know, he's that guy that I think is going to go from that second or third tier running back to a top five running back in fantasy football. And that is the league winning type of pick uh, in the late first round, early second round. I think he ha he fits in the category of somebody that could be the number one overall running back. You know, we always say at the beginning of the offseason, it's like, okay, these three guys are here, but the odds of these guys actually repeating, right. very, very low. We never know who's coming on. Last year, it was Dalvin Cook. Dalvin Cook, I got him wherever I could. He made the jump. And one of the reasons why is the same argument you have for DJ Chark, and that is Josh Jacobs actually broke out and most people don't even realize it to that level of talent starting with the talent look at pro football focuses overall running back grades nick chubb's number one he he's number one every he's, yeah, metric you can in running back christian mccaffrey is number three number two on pro football focus is running back grades last year josh jacobs Whew. absolutely Whew. dominant and what's crazy Whew. josh jacobs had Fewer than 50% of the total snaps of Christian McCaffrey last year. Woo! And yet still ended up an elite producer. He had that span I'm talking about. Eight games in the middle of the year, weeks four through 11, top five running back in fantasy football last year. With a busted shoulder. With a busted shoulder and almost no passing work at all. And if I've seen it in a stretch, I know he can do it for a long stretch if he stays healthy. Second in red zone touches per game among all running backs. Say what you want about... John Gruden, do the impressions if you want to. But uh, listen, man, he trusts his running backs in the red zone. And now, to be, was that an impression or was that simply using his terminology? Hey, man. <laughs> uh, I terminology, still terminology, I terminology. Same question. <laughs> same question. Uh, listen, man. Um, <laughs> trust, it's not good. Trust it in the red zone, as I said. And he was a rookie. And I love seeing oh, that. Like man. going back two years, uh, we saw when Marshawn had an opportunity in in Oakland. Now Josh Jacobs coming into year two. There's one caveat for success with Josh Jacobs. It's actually the same with Dalvin Cook or any other running back, and it is health. Gruden came out. He agrees on the fact that he needs to be much more heavily involved in the passing game. And this offseason, Josh Jacobs said 60 catches at least. Last year, didn't even come close to that. Gruden said he had a great year last year. We expect more out of him this year. Have to get him involved in the passing game, and more importantly, more on the field on third down. You get mm, him on the field on third like down, that. he's going to make a play. And the, ir the irony with Josh Jacobs yeah, is... Yeah, man, I like that. Yeah, man. I can't do yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's harder than you think. I just need some more sentences prepared for me. Um, did you see the impression of Sean McVay that's going around Twitter? Uh, no, no, McDonald's? I haven't. The I McDonald's haven't order yes, by Sean good. McVay? Unbelievable. Stay with me. <laughs> <laughs> stay with me, man. Um, but if he can stay healthy, I think Josh Jacobs is a stone-cold lock to be um, in that top five running back realm. I love it. I think his production goes way, way up. Like I said, half the snaps of Christian McCaffrey. Do I think he gets all the way there? Of course not. But the opportunity is right in front of him. Passing work is going to mean so much. The passing work, uh, you, you you said there's one big question. And of course, health is there for everyone. But the big question really, uh, assuming that every running back plays 16 games and, and, and that auto question is out, is the passing game work? And that's why 
I love Josh Jacobs so much this year. If you go back and look at any rookie who dominated on the ground over 1,100 yards as a rookie and then was fewer than 30 targets, they all go up. They, you know, we forget sometimes that Marshawn Lynch, Todd Gurley, some of these guys came in and in their rookie year, they weren't involved in the passing game at all, even yeah. though they had that skill set. Um, final thought, you know, when you talk about flag planting on a player, I ask, I answer the question that people have of, you know, which draft spot do you want? Because differently because of Josh Jacobs now. People had, you know, if you could draft a draft spot one, two, three. No, I, I want to be at 10. I want to take Josh Jacobs with my first pick because I have that much confidence in him. So I will talk about this next, my guy, because in multiple drafts this season, I have I've been at the 10 in one and the 11 in the other and twice came away with my guy in round one and your guy in round two. And I'm talking about a guy that should not be surprising because I've been talking about him for a long time. Kenyon Drake. Yeah, here we go. Let's here we go. Let's go down the <laughs> rabbit hole of Kenyon Drake's career. I, Jason, we we do have to. Yeah, we have, keep the podcast. We just, can cut for time if we have to. Yeah, you're you're gonna want to edit this in post, okay? Because you can't stop me right now. Yada yada yada, Here's, my guy. Yada yada yada, my guy. Kenyon Drake is very talented. I loved him coming out of school in in 2016. Unfortunately, he was drafted to the B hole when Adam Gase came to the Dolphins, and they drafted him. He was the third running back drafted that year. Oh. How did they use him? In his rookie year, he had half of his games under 5% of snaps, all but uh, two under 20%. He wasn't, he wasn't used in his rookie year at all. Second year, oh, half of his games under 5%, all but one under 20%. Uh, oh, wait, until uh, Damian Williams got injured. Oh, but that's, that's fine. J wait, Jay Ajayi also needed to get injured. Now, once those guys were injured, Adam Gase was like, all right, fine. I'll use fine. this high-drafted rookie that I, that I grabbed. And they go out, and he dominated. 1,100-yard pace, over 50 receptions, over 400 receiving yards, seven touchdown pace with the Dolphins. So what do they do? They've got this great back. The, going into the next year, they're going to use him, right? I, I was excited. People were excited. No, they bring in 35-year-old Frank Gore and make Kenyon Drake the backup. Kenyon Drake only had... Uh, 179 is, is rushes this a, that year. Is this a pro or anti Kenyon Drake story this that's is, happening, Jason? This is pro Kenyon Drake, anti Adam Gase. These are two of my favorite things to do, and I'm putting them both together here. Um, he he had fewer touches than Frank Gore, who was not efficient or good that year. So I'm I'm saying, you know, the the fallacy of rational coaching. Adam Gase is sure. not going to do what we necessarily think. So the question is, okay, what about the Cardinals? 2019 happened. He was traded to the Cardinals, and what did he do other than dominated? We, we, I mean, we know what happened. We know the story. He arrived on a Monday. He dominated the, the 49ers on a Thursday that week. From that time forward, he was the running back three in fantasy football behind only Derrick Henry and Christian McCaffrey, averaging 18.2 fantasy points per game. This offseason – is the first offseason he has. Three days ago, he was he was talking about he now understands the why behind Cliff Kingsbury's. Like, he knew the play, but he didn't know why and what the goal was. Now he understands the playbook more. Cliff Kingsbury's talking about we need to get him. He said the main thing with Drake this year is any way we can get him the ball in space, we're going to try to do. He's hard to tackle one-on-one -on -one in space. Look, the Cardinals offense is going to take a step forward. It's Kyler's year two. It's Cliff Kingsbury's year two. The offense is going to be great, and Kenyon Drake is the guy. That's the that's the big question, right? We we know we we see the talent on the field. It's is he actually going to be the guy? Is he going to get the workload this year? If we knew the answer to that question, and it was a yes, Kenyon Drake should be a top five running back. Last year, whoever the the running back one was for the Cardinals finished the year as the running back three. So uh, here's the thing. We know that, in fact, it also just came out that they were aiming to go after Kenyon Drake in this past offseason if they hadn't have traded for him. They targeted him as their guy. Then they got rid of David Johnson. Then they paid Kenyon Drake $10 million. He's their guy. They, pay at, they play at such a fast pace that they just don't get the chance to be like, okay, we're going to really split this up 60-40. It, it's just impossible. Uh, Kenyon Drake is being drafted as the RB11. What's the ceiling? 
I think his ceiling is RB3, where, where, where he finished. I think he absolutely could be a top five back because he's someone that will get north of 50 receptions and you know can have 11, 1,200 yards on the ground in a high-power offense. I hope you get your wish. And let me just say this about Chase Edmonds, David Johnson, mm -hmm. because there's a lot. Well, Chase Edmonds undervalued. Right. Uh, By but, me is what he's saying. Right. But yes. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of Andy saying that. <laughs> so <laughs> the end of last season, uh, Chase Edmonds was fully healthy, not on the injury report. He, he, after the bye week, he was there active. David Johnson, there active the entirety of the way. And they, so it's like, I don't understand why there's this. Why didn't they do it last year if they think he's so good? Well, you had a uh, – never mind. I'm not even going to answer. It's a My Guy episode. Um, Kenyon Drake, Jason's My Guy number one. Mike, let's move on. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, you knew this was going to happen. I had to make it happen, and I truly, truly believe my tight end sleeper of the year, Blake Jarwin. Jarwin's season is upon us. He is – Look, he's there with your last pick, and it is... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you calling for the Blake out? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Let me... I, oh. Let it simmer. Let it simmer. Yeah. I need to bring that to a boil, my think, man. Think about it. <laughs> Can he Blake out this year? Jarwin season, Blake out season is upon us. Mike's Look. been blaking out all <laughs> offseason. Okay, I wanna, I'm, I'm breaking this argument down into a couple sections. First, I want to talk about opportunity. Here is the opportunity that was allowed to Jason Witten with Dak Prescott. Now, I get it. Jason Witten, Hall of Fame tight end. He was not a Hall of Fame tight end at the back of the career. Look, he's had a long career. The best days are behind him. And yet still, he averaged with Dak 88 targets a game. He averaged finishing the a, a tight game? end. 88 targets a game. Thank you, Brooks. 88 targets a season. He averaged 88 targets a season. Uh, he averaged finishing as the tight end 11. This is Jason Witten, and now I get it. The tight end 11 is not great. Jason Witten, like I said, passed his prime because he was putting up 6.6 .6 yards per target, and yet the opportunity was there for Jason Witten. Last year, Witten ran the seventh most routes at the tight end position. He was out there. He was out there for opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Now, moving forward to Blake Jarwin. What is available for him? He, well, he's the number one, unquestioned number one tight end on this team. They gave him a four-year, $22 million deal. He is the guy. With j just j Jason Witten and Randall Cobb gone, that's 166 targets that are now available. Dak Prescott threw for nearly 5,000 yards last year. That's some opportunity that is available to Blake Jarwin, who still received you know, 41 targets last year as the backup tight end. Let's talk about efficiency. 8.9 yards per target for Blake Jarwin. That's a higher yards per target than Mark Andrews, than Hunter Henry, than Noah Fant. When the guy caught the ball, he made things happen. Yards per route run. So, you know, like which is... Uh, dividing the routes by the by the yards, 1.82 yards per route run, and I get it that that's there's not much context for that number, but that's a top 10 number at the tight end position. 21% of Blake Jarwin's routes, he was getting a target. Dak Prescott liked to go to him. Let's talk about big plays. In his young career, my man Blake Jarwin, he already has two 40-yard touchdowns. He can make the big play happen. This is not just you're hoping that in the red zone, from the two, they throw it, and the big tight end goes up and gets it. Now, my favorite stat about Blake Jarwin, which maybe it's anecdotal, but it is uh, it blows me away the names that are on this list. Seven tight ends ever in the history of the NFL have ever had a 100-yard game with three touchdowns. These are the names that are on that list. Rob Gronkowski, Antonio Gates, Tony Gonzalez, Shannon Sharp, Julius Thomas, Algie Crumpler. There is not one slouch on that list. Blake Jarwin is also on that list. Now, you, fluky? Maybe. But if it's, if it's so easy to do, why have only these tight ends done it, including Blake Jarwin? He is going at the very end of drafts. Unless you're in a draft with me, you're going to have to figure out how you're drafting Blake Jarwin in front of me. 
I don't. I'm not calling for the the ceiling. I'm not saying Blake Jarwin is a top three tight end, but I'm saying a tight end you can get with your last positional pick is going to be a top ten guy. And I do believe that Blake Jarwin can finish as like a top seven, a top six tight okay, end. So, so my question here, because obviously we we've talked about this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, tight end seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. They, they they don't help you that much in fantasy, even though they're a tight end one. And obviously, you just outlaid that. He could break out. He's running routes. There's vacated targets. He has the talent. I see the path. But what I want to know from you is what do you actually think will happen? What? N not his range of outcomes. You're making him a my guy. Where do you think he actually finishes highest probability? I, but the highest probability, like I said, actually he will be a type, top 10 tight end. And... Will he be startable every week? Yes. Okay. There, I think that's the one of the bigger then, markers yeah, for that's a tight the, end. That's the question. Like I said, I'm not putting him up. He's not George Kittle. I made the joke that he's the next Kittle. I'm, look, that's, that's being hyperbolic. But I believe that you can draft Jarwin and you can start him every single week and you don't have to go chase the dragon on the waiver wire hoping you're finding a tight end who, gets, who comes down with a touchdown. You're putting a guy in your lineup that has – the capability of putting up 100 yards and three touchdowns in a single game. The Blake out. The Blake out. All right. Believe. My second my guy is a player that seems to be, for whatever reason, forgotten. He put up 94 receptions for 1,100 yards and 10 touchdowns last year. He is being drafted as the wide receiver 15, yet finished last season as the wide receiver 4. And his name is Cooper Cup, Man. and nobody seems he finished to that four. care. He finished it four. I love this pick so so much. And so I think you know we, we when you look at the situation in Los Angeles, the the big discussion this off season has been the switch to twelve personnel. Cooper Cup's experience not being on the outside compared to being a slot wide receiver. The situation that you have, when I looked at this, when I dug into what Sean McVay talked about 12 personnel, when I look at what Cooper Cup has done historically, here's the headline. Snap counts are not predictive of Cooper Cup's production. Snap counts at the end of last year was a product of Sean McVay giving his wide receivers, who he uses as fullbacks in the running game so often, a break at the end of the year. He put... Johnny Munt, tight end, on the other side of Tyler Higby, on the field for 70% of snaps during those 12 personnel-centric games. Uh, who? Yes. <laughs> That's what I wanted to know when I saw that. Johnny Munt. No disrespect, Mr. Munt. I'm just not familiar with your Sean, work. Sean, <laughs> <laughs> Sean McVay made a decision because he came out and said, look, we use... Our tight ends, Josh Reynolds, Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, like fullbacks on our run design plays, we said, you know what? Let's let Johnny Munt take a few hits instead of Cooper Cup at the end of the year because he even he came out and he said this. He said, then our wide receivers stay sharper. Mm. Cooper Cup's biggest bust games last year, 98% snap count games. Cooper Cup's biggest week winning breakouts, 67%, 72%, 71%. He, it's not, it, when they want to go run heavy, when they do it, they schemed wide receivers off the field, Brandon Cooks and Cooper Cup at the end of the year. They put Higby, Higby on the field. They put Munt on the field. C Cooper Cup, 2018 pace for Cooper Cup. That was the year he got hurt, but he played more than half the, or half the season. Sure. 80 for 1,112. Cooper Cup's result last year, 94 for 1,110. He gets targeted in the red zone more than anyone in football not named Michael Thomas and Keenan Allen with 23 uh, red zone targets, go-to wide receiver, number one in touchdowns last year, elite route runner, elite after the catch. The team's lost 70 receptions between Brandon Cooks and Todd Gurley going into this year. I think Cooper Cup's as much of a lock for double-digit touchdowns as anybody in fantasy football. And Mike, you've brought this point up over and over again, the absolutely abnormal touchdown percentage for Jared Goff last year, 626 mm -hmm. passing attempts in the Los Angeles offense. Who are your weapons? Robert uh, Woods. Robert Woods and Cooper Cup. Yeah. Gerald Everett, Tyler Higby. I, you know, 22 touchdowns on 626 pass attempts last year. Anomalous. Yeah, it's way too low. 
Cup could have easily had 12, 14, 15 touchdowns in this offense last year if those numbers regulated to the mean. Um, and, and and the end of the result here is Sean McVay is an offensive mastermind. He uses his weapons. That's why he's a mastermind in this offense. Cooper Cup's the biggest weapon, and I, I'm just shocked that a wide receiver four is going as the wide receiver 15 right now. The the thing with me for Cooper Cup, he is, he is, ap, he is lower in my projections. Yeah, big disparity. And I've... Look, I'm I've been asked. Okay, who's the guy that you're you've got him ranked low that you're willing to and, lose on? And you're well, your most uh your most paranoid is going to make you look the fool. And it's Cooper Cup. Like I I I love the player. His production has it speaks for itself. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm taking my shot on what I I believe the the Rams are turning into, but Cooper Cup could make me look <laughs> the fool absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm a, a big fan. I'm glad you went with Cooper Cup, Andy, and I, I think it will work out. I love having him on my teams. The, the upside is there. Uh, By the, the way, your your My Guy Award is in the mail, Cooper, and I think he's a listener of the show. <laughs> he he is, follows man. me on Twitter. Possible. So, yeah. Um, we'll, get, we'll get your award. Now, out. is that the reason that you selected <laughs> him as a My Guy? We got to dig deep on this. I only select players that follow me, yeah. Okay. So All right. I, that's why you have Kyle Juszczyk coming up. Oh, my guy, Kyle. Oh, Dude, what's I love Kyle. Kyle um, all right. This next my guy I'm super excited to talk about. On the Sirius XM show a couple weeks ago, I talked about how he is criminally undervalued. He is wide receiver Tyler Lockett, mm -hmm. a.k.a. Hot Lockett. Thank you, Mike. Oh, that was very nice. You Look, guys Tyler Lockett <laughs> finished as the wide receiver 15 two years ago. And then his targets go up, and he finished as the wide receiver 14 last year. And now he's being drafted as the wide receiver 21 in the fifth round, two spots behind DK Metcalf. So, yeah, Jason, DK Metcalf. Which That's, you take personally. I take it you personally. Take it it's personally. nonsense. It's criminal. And I like DK Metcalf. This is not an anti-DK Metcalf take, as you'll see. We need a history lesson on Tyler Lockett's 2019. Oh, goodness. No, no, no. This oh, is man. just a one season. We're okay here. <laughs> Here's the thing that we we talk about all the time. Don't, don't look at a player's end-of-season rankings and forget the context of how it happened. That's part of why we love these guys is because we remember and we're reminding you of this is how the season played out. Do you guys remember how Tyler Lockett got injured in week 10? Do you remember that he injured his leg so bad that he was hospitalized? I do now. Oh, well, there yeah. you go. Yeah, here's a quote from Pete Carroll. What? <laughs> here's a quote Dude, from Pete Carroll from that, that from that game. He said that was the bruise, the real it bad was, bruise. Yes. Yeah. It, it was Tyler Lockett got a really a really bad lower leg bruise contusion that caused some issue we're working on, but it's a pretty severe situation right now for game night. They left him in the Bay Area hospital as the team traveled back to Seattle. That's not normal. That's a pretty serious thing. But if you look at the game logs, oh, he didn't miss any games, right? Because their bye week was next week. And still finished as the wide receiver 14? 14. Here's his next two. Compelling. Here's his next two weeks after the, the hospitalization for, uh, for a leg contusion. Ready? In the next two weeks, when he got back, he finished with one, one reception. He had one pass that was caught in those two weeks. In the two-week span? In the two-week span that he was back from that leg injury. He was so hurt. So he missed two games. He, but we people don't know it. Yeah. Do you know what he was going up to week nine, the wide receiver through before the injury? I would love to know. He was the wide receiver four. Mm. He was <laughs> flat he's dominating. The, he's the wide receiver four? But, but Jason. Oh, no. What he's about, talking to you, himself. <laughs> what about DK I'm leaving. Metcalf? <laughs> yeah, you guys take a, I got it from here. <laughs> what about DK Metcalf? Here's the thing. Those first nine weeks... DK Metcalf was the wide receiver 16. They were both dominating. Tyler Lockett is part of what makes this passing offense go. The rest of the season, Tyler Lockett was the wide receiver, or, or DK Metcalf was the wide receiver 49. But Jason. Yes, voice of, low voice of public opinion. <laughs> we, don't Sultry. Know, we don't know what DK Metcalf's ceiling is. They can both be wide receiver ones if they let Russ cook. They will both be at least wide receivers twos no matter what happened. And the thing is, is he finished the season that last month. He was back. He was a wide receiver two. Then in the playoffs, if you don't remember, he absolutely dominates. 13 receptions, 196 yards, and a touchdown in two playoff games. So 
look at the two. He had two playoff games. He had two games that he was basically injured, not on the field. That's 16 total healthy games. Not an extrapolation, actual games played. And in those 16 games, there was 123 targets, 94 receptions, 1,200 yards, nine touchdowns. That would have put him wide receiver five on the season. Tyler Lockett is a superstar. He dominates reception perception. In his last 180, 180 targets, got there, got there. <laughs> in his, and this is thanks to Clutch Fantasy on, on Twitter. He pointed out Michael Thomas in his last 180 targets, 149 receptions, 1,700 yards, nine touchdowns. Julio Jones in his last 180 targets, 118 receptions, 1,600 yards, nine touchdowns. Tyler Lockett's? 139 receptions, 2,022 yards, and 18 touchdowns. Tyler Lockett's a superstar. He, he's you can a, get him in the fifth he's round. He's a hidden superstar. And the, the nice thing about that target metric stat that you have is that it does not illustrate passing volume problems for Seattle, which is why it's an illusion mm. that Tyler Lockett's not a top talent viewed through the lens of the NFL. He's also not as enormous as DK Metcalf, which causes people to – uh, to doubt things as well. And it, it's it's perfect that he's a my guy for you. I'm so glad that you and Tyler could come together in this moment. I love you, Tyler. All right. One my guy left. All right. I'm no gonna, history lessons. I'm going to jump in here. I, I'll, I'll try to keep this one a little bit more brief. It's a player from Washington. You know what's about to happen. Antonio Gibson. I love that right now we don't know who you're going to say. <laughs> I know. I'm we like, still don't know who you're going to say. No, that's what I say. Antonio Gibson is not the actual my guy. You know that he is. Everyone, you already know it. Give me the credit. <laughs> I want to talk about Terry McLaurin. I am madly in love with the number one wide receiver for Washington. As a rookie, a rookie, he finished with 93 targets, over 900 yards, seven touchdowns. His rookie production is incredibly similar to Andre Johnson, Julio Jones, Juju, Deshaun Jackson, these are great wide receivers in the league. He played two fewer games than the aforementioned DK Metcalf. You know who finished higher in fantasy? Terry McLaurin. And he's being drafted behind DK Metcalf. Oh, is he really? Yes, despite the fact that Terry McLaurin is the unquestioned number one wide receiver for his team. He opened, again, as a rookie, he opened the season with three straight top 20 games was in fact the wide receiver eight through those weeks. And this was on a team that ranked 28th in pass attempts and ranked 30th in neutral situation pass rate, meaning when the game is close, that Washington last year, they ran. They were a very curmudgeon -y. We're going to give the ball to Adrian Peterson. And now they have moved on to Ron Rivera and Scott Turner, who last year, that combo the, between the two of them, second in pass attempts, fourth in neutral game script pass rate. They were passing nearly 40 times a game. So you're talking potentially a huge opportunity bump here for Terry McLaurin. Coach speak warning. I've given the warning here. But this oh, is do, do you want me to push the coach speak button? We we <laughs> All right. We really need one. But Ron Rivera talking about Terry McLaurin. He's a guy that could be on the verge of stardom. He really is. He compared him to DJ Moore, who DJ Moore, this is what happened. That's a better physical comp, too. And this is what happened with DJ Moore from his rookie year to his sophomore year with the breakout. DJ Moore went from 82 targets to 135. DJ Moore was averaging five targets a game and shot up to nine and a half targets per game. Terry McLaurin is a top 4% speed score guy. I found this incredible while I was researching Terry McLaurin. You know who asked Terry McLaurin for tips on route running? Odell Beckham Jr. You know what I like about the DJ Moore comp, Mike? What's that? They didn't have any quarterbacks in Carolina last year. And DJ and Moore. And it didn't, it didn't slow the breakout down. Like DJ, that's a, I would go with that. DJ Moore still was able me. to get it done. Now, if you want to talk about his reception perception, Terry McLaurin, had the third best score versus press coverage in rookie history in the, in the entire metric of reception perception. Who's in front of him? Odo Beckham and Tyreek Hill. He passed the eyeball tests he, as well yeah, all last year. He I mean, passed, just watch him. He passed it week one. Nearly 30% of McLaurin's targets are deep targets. They are the really high value targets. I mean, he can take those DJ Moore screens to the house, the, the slant routes to the house, but he can also go deep. 
He had three games with 100-plus yards and a touchdown. That's tied with DeAndre Hopkins, Mike Evans, Julio Jones. Terry McLaurin is a superstar in the making. We just need to get a little bit, little bit more reliable play from the quarterback, which I do believe is do believe can happen on top of the huge volume increase that I am projecting from Washington from last year to this year with the new coaching staff. Being drafted as the wide receiver 23, finishes the year as the wide receiver what? What? Where do I have him finishing? Yeah, where do you think he finishes? I think he easily finishes as a top 15 guy, and the ceiling for Terry McLaurin is a top 10 wide receiver. Okay, all right. My final my guy... He did not have a great he did not have a great time last year cuz it was a difficult situation but this is really the OG my guy of the entire year he's he's what what are you looking at are you, are you pivoting back to AJ Green no i'm not <laughs> no no i'm not uh same team though nice uh one of my favorite pure runners in all of football joe mixon is my third my guy for 2020 how bad was it for joe mixon trying to run the football with what he had in Cincinnati last year. They graded out uh, 32 of uh, 32 teams in run blocking. 32nd best. 32nd best. This year, uh, oh, by the way, he had a, a combination of Andy Dalton and Ryan Finley behind center, the worst offensive line in football, the worst record in football. They have Joe Burrow now because of it. What? How did he respond to that? Watch the tape. He ran harder, faster, more often, didn't break down, broke out. Now he gets Jonah Williams, their left tackle. By the way, he ran right more than anybody in football. He just ran away from the absence of Jonah Williams on the left side. It cannot be worse on the offensive line and at the quarterback position than what they had last year. And I was just so incredibly impressed with Joe Mixon. Much like Josh, Josh Jacobs, my first my guy, who I think is this season-long breakout, you have to see top five potential in a stretch of games. Mixon... I think he's one of the best runners in all of football. And over the last eight weeks, with the worst offensive line in football, he was the RB4 from week 10 on. You saw it against Pittsburgh. You saw it against Baltimore. And it wasn't just a burst game here or there. He was top five. Uh, he, he had it consistently throughout the end of the year. So he ran harder. And I love seeing that because this team was losing games. I don't know what they lost to Baltimore by. But they had a game in there where they lost 49 to 12 or something like that. Yet, Zach Taylor recognized something really quickly. And that's why Mixon's snap count started to go up. They started to trust him in all phases of the game. They started to realize and did unleash Joe Mixon. Do you worry at all that what he realized was, ooh, we can get that number one pick. <laughs> Let's keep handing the ball off while we're down. Well, his comments this offseason reflect what I think he realized, which is that he says this. He says, and this is from the Brian Callahan, their OC. Gets better the more carries he gets. As the season went along, we got better at getting him those touches when he's getting the ball, quote, 20-plus times. The total at the end of the game means his numbers are usually pretty good. He's effective in terms of touches. We didn't see, much like Josh Jacobs, we didn't see the incredible pass-catching work mm -hmm. from Joe Mixon. His skill set reflects incredible pass-catching capability, but we didn't get to see a lot of it. Joe Burrow is who supp supplied incredible value to Clyde Edwards Alaire at LSU. I believe he had uh, 55 receptions. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> they want to get him. When you looked at the pass catching metrics for Joe Mixon last year, it was on par with Austin Eckler. That's the talent level that you had with Joe Mixon in terms of yards per reception at the, at the running back position. He just didn't have somebody to get him the ball on the reg like he did the year before. When you have an offensive coordinator who wants to give a running back 20-plus carries, somebody who runs as, who is as talented as Joe Mixon, I am shooting for the Josh Jacobs-Joe Mixon combination in, at the end of the first, top of the second. I think both have potential to be top five running backs. So I'm going to make Joe Mixon my last my guy. All righty. Let's get to my final guy. Shut it down, Jay. I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anyone because – I'm going to Hollywood. Yeah. Hollywood, Marquise Hollywood Brown is my third and final my guy for 2020. Here is a player that I loved when I scouted Baker Mayfield a couple years ago, and I was like, who is this little itty-bitty guy? <laughs> 
destroying everybody. And I didn't know who Marquise Brown was at that time. I didn't know if he was actually an NFL talent. Fast forward two years, and unfortunately, he is injured. He can't go to the combine. He is undersized. Oh, he's the first wide receiver drafted in the NFL draft because he is actually really, really good. We see him come out as, you know, first game as uh, an NFL wide receiver and put up 147 oh yards and two touchdowns. The Dolphins game? Yeah, it, <laughs> he did that on 18% of snaps. So you, you kind of see the big play upside. But he obviously got injured, an ankle injury through the season. I believe that was in week five. Missed a couple of games. Came back and then wasn't really utilized the same. They kept his snap percentages lower. Obviously, in the playoffs, when it mattered, and they're like, y y they were actually down for once. I mean, you saw seven receptions, 126 yards. He was great. Now, I've talked about him a lot, so I'm not going to you know, keep droning on, but I do want to give a shout out to Curtis Patrick. Great follow on Twitter because I was tagged about a million times in an article that he wrote talking up Marquise Hollywood Brown. It's a very persuasive article. It is. It has some great research. And here was his findings uh, because I've given all my research in the past. First round rookie wide receivers. He checks that box who had five targets per game in their rookie year, checks that box, and had a positive fantasy points over expectation per attempt. He checks that box. Those that do those three things, 90% score over 200 fantasy points per game, and they average 237 and a half fantasy points per game in their sophomore season. That would be the wide receiver 10, the wide receiver 15, the wide receiver 12 over the past three seasons. And the only guys who had as much efficiency as Hollywood Brown did were Calvin Ridley, Odell Beckham Jr., Julio Jones, and Mike Evans. He was drafted to be a star. He's tied to a great offense, a great quarterback. He also but, but is... Jason. <laughs> yes, voice of public opinion. What if they signed Des Bryant? Oh, please sign Des Bryant, <laughs> because maybe that means they won't sign Antonio Brown. Uh, Antonio Brown would have me a little bit more worried, who is ironically the cousin of Hollywood Brown. Um, they train together, which is, hey, if you're going to learn from someone, maybe learn some route tips from your cousin Antonio Brown. Just make Brown. sure you're only learning route tips yes. from Antonio only, Brown. Yeah. Let's keep it to only football. Only the football uh, aspects. But my point is this. He was drafted to be great. He's tied to a great offense. He's undervalued. He's in the sixth round. And I don't think he's going to be a super consistent player. He's not a guy that I want as my wide receiver one. But in the sixth round, you're putting a guy in your flex that can just win you a week. I think he has a major breakout season this year. He's a lock for wide receiver two to me. I think his upside is a wide receiver one. Hollywood. Hollywood. Up to no good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that'll do it for our My Guys episode. We want to thank Pristine Auction. This is the final day of Pristine Auction's Fantasy Week. Uh, they have an auction dedicated to all the fantasy football stars, all kinds of items. Bidding starts at $20, no reserves. Use the code BALLERS to get a $10 credit at pristineauction.com. We did it, guys. We made we it We just through. named the top nine fantasy scorers for 2020 in order of fantasy points. Can I you can't believe, believe it? I can't believe we did it. Unbelievable. See you tomorrow. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.